Before jumping into the details of the Bay of Pigs invasion, I want to make sure we understand the environment in Cuba and the United States leading up to the invasion. So going into the late 1950s, Cuba was controlled by this guy right over here, Batista. And he was a dictator that was supported by the United States. And just to give a sense of what he was like, here's a quote from John F. Kennedy in 1963. So this is after he's already had a, all, you know, the Bay of Pigs has happened, the Cuban Missile Crisis has happened. He is not a, a big fan of Fidel Castro. But with that said, in hindsight, JFK did say this. And this is, I, I think, a pretty objective assessment of what Batista was like as the dictator of Cuba. This is John F. Kennedy saying this. I believe there's no country in the world, including any and all the countries under colonial domination, where economic colonization, humiliation, and exploitation were worse than in Cuba, in part owing to my country's policies during the Batista regime. To some extent, it is as though Batista was the incarnation of a number of sins on the part of the United States. Now we shall have to pay for the, those sins. So even John F. Kennedy, in hindsight, is saying that B Batista really was not was really not the best person, and it really was not a good idea for the United States to support such a corrupt uh, uh, a dictator for so long in Cuba. And this is Batista right over here riding with some US generals in a parade when he visited DC. So you can imagine he was not a popular person in control of Cuba. And in 50, 1959, you have a successful revolution against him. 1959, there is a revolution. And the revolution is led by this character, Fidel Castro. Fidel Castro and his kind of number two, his 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 right hand men, his right hand men are Raúl Castro and Che Guevara right over here, and they take control of Cuba. They're part of this nationalist revolutionary movement. Now, the one thing they do do, and, and they are left-leaning from the beginning. People assume that they are uh, uh, maybe communist or quasi-communist. But even from the get-go, as soon as they take power, they start uh, taking over lands that were owned by, well, one that was private property, private Cuban property, some of it that was United States property. Their argument would have probably been that this was that this was wealth, that this was private property that was uh, that was that was ill-gotten, that was gotten in the time of Batista. But they. They did it on a, in, a, in a broad sweep. So they took over a lot of private land, a lot of private property, which also led to people thinking that, hey, you know, this is not just a nationalist revolution. This is also a communist revolution. But you could also imagine that once they take over, there's this huge, there's this huge migration of Cubans to the United States, and they're, they're, and it's primarily a middle class, upper middle class Cubans, educated Cubans, who are really afraid of what Fidel Castro is doing in terms of, in terms of taking over uh, a private land, taking people's property. So you have, you start having this, this Cuban exiled community really focused around Florida and and and, to, uh, and mainly Miami, and they're still there. And they're very unhappy with this Fidel Castro character right over here. So when we fast forward into 1961, John F. Kennedy becomes president. He gets elected in 1960, becomes president in early 1961. We're now fast forwarding to April 1961. So John F. Kennedy has only been president for a few months. But you can imagine on a lot of levels, you have all of these Cuban exiles, upper middle class, educated, middle class Cuban exiles who hate Fidel Castro. He's taking over their land. He's turning it into a, uh, it looks like a leftist state. You have, this is all happening within the context of the Cold War. The United States is afraid of countries falling to communism. It looks like Fidel Castro is a communist. So the United States Besides the fact that you have all of these exiles who want to oust him, the United States probably wants to oust him just because he's a communist. And they're, they're afraid that he's going to align himself with the Soviet Union. So in conjunction with these, with the Cuban exiles and the CIA, and this right here is the director of central intelligence during the Kennedy administration, or at least the beginning part of the Kennedy administration, this is Alan, Alan Dulles. His brother is John Foster Dulles that Dulles Airport is named after, and he was a, a US Secretary of State. They decide that they want to 
oust Fidel Castro. But they want to do it in a way, they want to do it in a way that the United States does not look like it's the one doing the invasion. So what they do is they plan an invasion where they'll take Cuban exiles and they get 1400 1400 men to sign up. So 1400 exiled Cubans exiled Cubans to sign up to be kind of part of this CIA backed US US backed force to invade Cuba and overthrow Fidel Castro. And a lot of this was based on the premise and you can imagine this and this even happened in the Iraq war where the CIA, the the American president, they kind of surround themselves with people who tell them who one give them a very optimistic scenario, a very hopeful scenario telling them, "Look, we represent what the rest of the Cuban people want. Where they, they'll say, look, if we just start a revolution, Fidel Castro will be overthrown. The reality that came out, at least at that point in time, in the early 1960s, Fidel Castro was actually pretty popular with the Cuban people. And you can imagine he was at that time pretty popular with the poor people who did not have land. And now all of a sudden, you, you have this, uh, this I guess you could call him you know, leader for the people. And, I'm, and, and I'm not, I don't know about his popularity now, but at that point, he was probably a lot more popular than the exiles and the CIA would have had Kennedy believe. And so they plan this attack. Kennedy says, oh, if we can get rid of, if we can get rid of Fidel Castro, then that, that de-risks the possibility of having this, this communist nation right off of the Florida coast. So they planned this invasion, and you know it's it's shady to begin with because they didn't want to make it look like an official U.S. invasion. They wanted to make it look like it was a pure uh, a Cuban counter-revolutionary, and to to some degree that really kind of mixed up everything and made it look uh, well. And it really was suspect because you know, they really were doing something that was not uh, not what it what it really was. But the invasion, the way it all worked out is that by April 15th, on April 15th. And this is just going into the details of the invasion. So they had the 1,400 exiles. They had some some uh, some ships, some some planes. They marked them. They either removed the markings so that it didn't look like they were American ships or planes, or they put markings. They put false markings of the Cuban military so that it would look so it would cause some confusion or whatever. And so on April 15th, 1961. And remember, this is only a few months into Kennedy's administration. You start. They start air attacks, and these air attacks launch from Nicaragua, and they go to they go to Cuba. And the whole point of these air attacks are to kind of soften the Cuban air force for an eventual invasion by the 1,400 exiles. And so they have you have eight aircraft, eight uh, uh, bombers leading uh, leaving Nicaragua. They bomb they bomb Cuba at a base outside of Havana and and a base near the south, actually not too far from current Guantanamo Bay. And the point, and, and their, their goal was to destroy the Cuban Air Force. It turns out they didn't do it. And once again, they did it to, to kind of cause confusion. They did it under the markings, not of US bombers, but they put Cuban Air Force markings on the planes to cause confusion. You had eight planes going and, try and doing the bombings. One of them gets shot down. And a ninth plane actually leaves from Nicaragua, and they falsely put bullet holes in it to look like it was hit with anti-aircraft guns, and it, and had it defect to Florida. So I guess the idea behind this was to make it look like there's a Cuban pilot who takes off from Cuba or somehow gets out of Cuba with a Cuban plane. That's that's why they put the markings there, and then tries to destroy a bunch of uh, a Cuban uh, aircraft and then defects the United States. That's the impression that they wanted to convey. It's not so clear that the the Cubans actually fell for it. And so that happened in 1961. Most everyone kind of saw this as a U.S. attack, or at least said they thought viewed it as a U.S. attack. And then you fast forward to the night of April 16th, which I haven't written over here. April 16th. And this whole time, everyone was expecting a U.S. attack. And this is one of the things that it all gets, uh, you know, this this was, it all leads to the fact this was not a well well orchestrated series of events. Is that it, it's pretty well established that some of these exiles, uh, you know, were just not as tight lipped as they should have been about the invasion. It got out. It got to it got to Soviet intelligence. The Cubans knew that an invasion was imminent. So on April 16th, you have kind of a false attack.
a decoy attack at Bahia Honda right over here, which really just a bunch of decoy boats with loudspeakers on them that made it sound like they were firing and to cause confusion. And it did temporarily cause Castro to, to look in that direction because they were so they were kind of on hair trigger notice expecting an imminent invasion, but that wasn't the real one. This was on the evening of April 16th. But then when you go to the early morning of April 17th, you have the real invasion where you have the 1400 where you have the 1,400 Cuban exiles with CIA and US military support, but all of that was hidden, to actually invade at the Bay of Pigs. And this right here is the Bay of Pigs. And to make a long story short, it was kind of a, it, the, the invasion did not go well. And it has been blamed on bad planning, on, 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 on incompetence on some parts of the invasion. If the invasion lasted from April 17th, this was the first day of the invasion, by, but by April 19th, essentially the invading force, the counter-revolutionary force, the, the 1,400 Cuban exiles, had been pushed back to the beaches. And for the most part, about a, hundred, a little over 100 of them uh, were killed, and most of them, over 1,000 of them, were captured. So over, over 1,000 captured. And then later on in the year, uh, Fidel Castro, and some were executed after being captured, uh, but later on in the, in the year, Fidel Ca Castro uh, makes a deal with the United States where he hands over the captured exiles to the United States in exchange for $58 million in aid and supplies and all the rest. So this, at least from a, a military point of view, was a, was a, a, a complete debacle from uh, the United States point of view. And when you, you know, you can imagine after this happened, people in the United States started pointing figures. You have the CIA, and this is Alan Dulles right here, and the exiles blaming the Kennedy administration, saying that, look, he wasn't willing to do what it takes to actually do a proper invasion. He wasn't willing to provide the proper air support once the invasion started happening. He wasn't willing to commit more US troops once the invasion started looking like it wasn't going in the direction of the exiles. Kennedy, on the other hand, blames the CIA. He says, look, this was, this was just done. This was planned incompetently. And he also says that you gave me all sorts of misinformation. You told me that once the invasion started, that there was, there was all sorts of resentment against Fidel Castro and it would cause this broader uprising, which never, ever happened. And so this is actually a, co a quote from John F. Kennedy that he, he said after the Bay of Pigs invasion, the first advice I'm going to give my successors is to watch the generals and to avoid feeling that because they were military men, their opinions on military matters were worth a damn. This is John F. Kennedy saying this after the Bay of Pigs invasion. Now, you can dig deeper and figure out who probably was in the right here. But the bottom line is, is that it led to all, I guess, all round negative consequences for the United States. After this, after this, it kind of strengthened Fidel Castro's hold on Cuba. He was like, hey, that was the United States' best shot. Huge embarrassment for them. It, it allowed him to concentrate his control. It also caused him to now become very openly communist. And also, he was now, before the Bay of Pigs invasion, he was kind of trying to get the, the US to, to somewhat like him, although they wouldn't like him because he was taking over private property and, and, and he was clearly left leaning. But after the Bay of Pigs invasion, he definitely aligned himself closely with the Soviet Union. So you know, he became much more open about being a Marxist, Leninist, communist state. And because he was afraid of future uh, US invasions, he, he was open to what eventually leads to the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is the Soviet Union actually placing, actually placing uh, uh, ballistic missiles nuclear with nuclear warheads in Cuba w at short range to the United States. So it, it, it set up this whole series of events that really didn't work in, in the U.S.'s favor.